All right, I'm excited to continue this series of Common Threads. We've been looking at some themes that run from Genesis to Revelation because understanding these themes, being able to recognize these in Scripture to know what they mean and how they're connected throughout the Bible really helps us when we sit down and just open God's Word. Whenever you you open to any part of Scripture, you run into one of these themes, you're able to recognize that and say, okay, I understand that this started in Genesis and this finds its fulfillment in Revelation. And we can uh, connect those dots and it really expands our understanding of Scripture uh, together. So we've talked about the theme of the image of God um, so th- this kind of, they all kind of overlap and they build on each other. So who, who are we as, as the image of God? The next week we talked about Sabbath and that as people created in the image of God, we have a very um, healthy rhythm of work and rest. Last week, Matthew did a great job walking us through the temple. So people who are created in the image of God, who have a healthy uh, rhythm of work and rest, we also encounter God. And how do we, where do we encounter God? And, and that place is called the temple. And that place, uh, that the temple place is now us. We are now the temple. We are the place where we encounter God. And so today we're going to talk about what holiness means. <clears throat> and holiness is one that if you guys had known, that's what I was going to talk about today, you might not have been here or tuned in because I think it's, it's, a, it's a word that, uh, holy is a word that's just sort of gotten a negative connotation. I mean, if you think about um, if, if somebody calls you a holy roller, is that a compliment? Is that... Is that, are they saying they really respect you and admire you if you're a holy, holy roller? Um, what, what if somebody uh, accuses you of being holier than thou? Is that, a, is that like, a, oh, good job. You, you should put that on a t-shirt, holier than thou. That's you. Uh, no, we don't. That's not how we think of it. We even put the word holy before other four-letter words that we use as curse words. I, I, the, the word holy has just kind of gotten this negative connotation in our culture. And I think... I think there's some reasons why. I think one of the reasons why is because we look at holiness as this idea of moral perfection. Holy, if you're holy, that means that you, you only do what's good, you never do what's bad. And, the, and, and for us, we kind of go, that's, that's not me. In, in fact, I feel like that's impossible. And, and when we're tasked with something that we feel is impossible, we get defeated and we start to, find defense mechanisms for how are we going to deal with this task we have that has become impossible. I used to think that I was going to dunk on a, on a, a 10-foot goal when I was a kid. I thought that the day is coming when you're eight or nine years old, you're just sure that that's going to happen. You feel like it's your destiny. Uh, when you're 14 and 15 and, and you know, you're, I'm just barely touching the rim at, at, at my best days, and I thought, man, just a couple more years and I'll get, surely I'll grow more. I'm not, surely I'm not done growing at 14 and I'll grow a little bit more and I'll, I'll dunk on a 10-foot goal. That was that was like my death. I just knew this is going to happen. Uh, it, it never happened. Um, it, and so what I figured out was when I was in high school and college is that I could dunk on a nine-foot goal. So I would start looking for adjustable basketball goals. What a great invention. You know, you can lower those things down and dunk on a nine-foot goal because the feeling of dunking a basketball is just really pretty special. It's pretty amazing. <clears throat> now I can't even dunk on an eight-foot goal. I, I can't like, I can almost just touch the rim by standing and, t- and I still can't dunk on it because I don't, I just don't jump very well. I've never been a good jumper. Uh, made a movie about me called White Man Can't Jump. That's, that was about me. Um, I, that's just never, and so what do we do when we, when we realize that a goal that we had set for ourselves is impossible? We either just give up or what do we do? We lower the goal, like I did with the basketball. We just lower the goal. And so when it comes to holiness, and we think, well, holiness is something I can never attain, we either just give up and we say, well, forget, well, I'm just forgetting the idea of holiness. We're going to put that in a different category and, uh, uh, of things that not, they're not my responsibility. Or we lower the goal and we begin to talk about holiness in different terms that may not be true to what Scripture really means when it talks about the holiness of God and the holiness of the people that God has called his own. So today we're gonna explore this uh, from the beginning to the end of Scripture. We're gonna see what it means to be holy, how God is holy, and, and what does it mean that God has, has called us into holiness? There's a, a line from Leviticus. God says, be holy as I am holy. And Peter repeats this phrase again in his letter. So what does this mean for us? So let's first, let's start by talking about the holiness of God. What does it mean that God is holy? We know what other words mean when we say, when we say God is all knowing. We know what the words all knowing mean, right? He knows everything. When we say God is, is 
is present everywhere. It's omnipresent. We know what being present in a place, we know what that means. But the word holy, what does holy actually mean? Holy is best defined in contrast with what it's not, right? To compare God to, to all of creation and say, what is, how does God relate to everything else in the universe? You would say, well, everything else is ordinary, but God. God is not like anything else in all creation. That's holiness. In fact, God, God is so unlike everything in creation that, that you can't use words to compare things in creation to God. Any comparison that you make, God is like a mountain. No, he's not. God is like the sun. No, he's not. God is not like anything in all of creation. That's what holiness means. In fact, so what, this is what we're going to uh, talk about today. Holiness is, is kind of like this contrast between light and dark. We're going to light a candle. This is going to work, I promise. What is wrong with this candle? <laughs> Guys, it worked in rehearsal. Oh, okay. Man, I didn't think I was going to have technical difficulties with a candle. All right, so uh, what is a light is defined by its contrast to darkness. That's how we understand what light is. If there, if there was no such thing as darkness, we wouldn't understand light the way that we do, right? This, this is what holiness means. When we say that God is holy, what we're doing is we're trying to understand God in contrast to everything else. Ordinary things are created. God is not created. God is holy. Ordinary things are temporary. They have a beginning and an end. God is not temporary. He's eternal. He is Holy, you with me? Ordinary things are dependent, right? They, they, they can't stand alone, they can't survive alone, they can't make themselves, they can't end themselves. God is not dependent on anything or anyone. God is independent, he is holy, right? Ordinary things are limited. They have boundaries with when, which they can function. God is not limited, he doesn't have any boundaries. He is holy, right? Ordinary things are imperfect, they have flaws, God is not imperfect. He has no flaws. He is holy, right? This is how we understand the holiness of God is in contrast to what, it's what he's not. What is God not? He is, he's not created. He's not temporary. He's not like us. He's not like anything else we can see. God is, is holy. And because God is holy, he's so different from everything else, then whatever he interacts with or come in contact, comes in contact with changes, by nature of being in contact or in proximity with God. Example, uh, Moses meets God on a mountain, Exodus chapter three. First time we, we understand Moses meeting God, Exodus three, uh, let me read uh, this familiar story to you. Now Moses was tending the flock of, his, of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. If you listen to Matthew's sermon last week, you understand the significance of the mountain of God, that's where God is. The angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire from within a bush. Moses saw that though the bush was on fire, it did not burn up. So Moses thought, I will go over and see this strange sight, why the bush does not burn up. When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called to him from within the bush, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. Do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals for the place where you are standing is holy ground. What? Hang on, I, th I thought God was holy. How is, how is the ground holy? What, what makes the ground holy? The ground is in proximity to a holy God, therefore the ground is holy. And not only is the ground holy, <clears throat> but somehow the ground has become dangerous to Moses. This is just normal dirt that Moses has walked on a thousand times as he's trampled all through the wilderness, leading his sheep for 40 years. But suddenly this ground is now dangerous to him. Why? Because of the proximity of God. It's not because God wants to hurt Moses, but it's because something unholy cannot be in the presence of something holy. It's dangerous. It's, it's like, I, I cannot touch this flame. Ow, I can, but it hurts. Don't do that. Ow. I didn't mean to do that. It hurts. 
really surprised at my stupidity right now. So you, you can't just like, if you're another flame, you can touch it with another flame, but you can't touch it with your hand. It, it burns, not because the flame is evil and it wants to hurt me. It's just because that's its nature. It's, it's hot, right? So I can't just, I can't just touch the flame. It, something that's ordinary, like Moses was ordinary, cannot be in the presence of something holy, like God is holy, without, without there being a cost. There's always gonna be a cost when something ordinary comes into the presence of something holy. So from this point, God, this holy God invites Moses into this adventure and they're gonna set these people free, the, the Israelites from, from slavery. They, they accomplish this. They're, they're in the land, they're in the, in the desert on their way to the promised land. And God begins to explain to the people how ordinary people are gonna have a relationship with a holy God. And part of this is the tabernacle that Matthew talked about last week, this, this physical place where God is gonna show up and dwell. And who gets to go into the, the place where God dwells? Everybody, does it, do you and I, can we just, can we just waltz into the, to the presence of God in the tabernacle? No way. What would happen if we did that? What would happen if, if just a regular Israelite just kind of waltzed in to the Holy of Holies where God was present? They would die. Why? Because God is evil and wants to hurt people? No, because he's holy and they're unholy. So God begins to go through this process of explaining like, okay, we're gonna have a relationship, but in order for us to have a relationship, you guys have to become holy so that you can be in relationship with me because I'm not gonna become unholy. That's not how it's gonna go. If we're gonna have a relationship, you're going to become holy. And there's some words that the Bible uses for this process of ordinary things becoming holy. And the words are words that you use every day, I'm sure, consecrated and sanctified, right? Those, Those in your daily vocabulary? Yeah, me neither. Consecrated and sanctified. We come across those words in scripture and here's what they mean. They mean something that's being set apart for use in worship to God, or something's being set apart to be close to the presence of God. It's, it becomes consecrated or it becomes holy. So here's an example of how something or someone becomes consecrated or holy. This is from Exodus chapter 29, when God is given instructions for the priests. The priests are the ones who are allowed to go into the tabernacle and, and worship and serve there. So if, if they don't want to die, they have to be consecrated. What happens? Uh, here's, here's how God describes it. Uh, take some blood from the altar and some of the anointing oil and sprinkle it on Aaron and his garments and on his sons and their garments. Then he and his sons and their garments will be consecrated. Okay, so there's been a sacrifice has been made. So an animal has been killed. So there's some blood available from the animal sacrifice. And this blood goes on to Aaron and his sons and on their clothes because their clothes are ordinary. And if their clothes are gonna be in the presence of God, even their clothes have to be made holy. So their clothes have to be consecrated and they're consecrated by blood. Remember, remember we said that if, if something ordinary is gonna approach something holy, there has to be a cost, a price must be paid. And so the price paid is the animal sacrifice. This animal dies and the blood of the animal, which uh, is in a a very uh, real sense is dealing with the thing that makes us ordinary and unholy is sin and death, right? That's what makes us ordinary and unholy. It's what makes us unlike God is sin and death. And so the animal sacrifice is is addressing sin and death and, and the contact with the blood takes something ordinary and consecrates it, sanctifies it, makes it holy so it can be in the presence of God. So that's the process. If you, if you want to move, go into the presence of God, something has to die, the blood has to touch you, and then you can go in, right? That's the way it works for hundreds of years for the people of Israel. If they want to be near the presence of God, there has to be an animal sacrifice, there has to be consecration. This even is true for the, the furniture that's in the tabernacle, like the lampstand. It starts as just a regular old golden lampstand like we all have in our homes, right? And then it's consecrated, There's, they sprinkle blood on it, and now it can be used in the tabernacle for worship because something that's ordinary cannot be in the presence of something that's holy. Then, then we come to this really interesting uh, event in in life of Isaiah. In Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah is in the temple. So if Isaiah is in the temple, what what should be true about him at this point? Hopefully he's been consecrated. If not, Isaiah's in trouble, right? Because he's in the temple and he sees the Lord. The Lord shows up in the temple 
Isaiah says in this beautiful passage, the train of his robe filled the temple. And what, what is Isaiah's reaction? Sweet, man, God is here. I, great, I've been, I got some questions. I've been wanting to talk to you. No, Isaiah's response is, uh-oh, <laughs> I'm in trouble. I am not sanctified. He's a woe to me. And I, I like the word woe because woe means stop, right? If you're driving a horse, but that's not how he uses it, but that's how I always think of it. Isaiah's like, stop, this, this can't happen. I am not holy. I am not sanctified. I can't be in the presence of God. So God sends this person, creature, angel thing, seraphim thing, and it takes a hot coal from the altar and it touches it to Isaiah's lips. And it says, now y- your lips have been consecrated and, and now you can be in the presence of God. So here, here we have a different way for something that's ordinary to be made holy. So instead of Isaiah going through this process and an animal dying, God actually transfers holiness by his own choice to Isaiah. So Isaiah can be in his presence and hear the word that God has for his people. All right. So again, uh, in Ezekiel, we, Ezekiel chapter 47, <clears throat> he goes through this, uh, he has this vision of the temple. So in Ezekiel's time, the, the temple has been destroyed. There is, no, there is no temple in Jerusalem. It's been destroyed. But he has a vision of the temple rebuilt. And in his vision of the temple in Isaiah four, Ezekiel 47, there is a river that flows from the temple. And, and this river, everything it touches grows and flourishes and thrives. And so what, what do we know about what happens in the temple? The presence of God is there and the presence of God is holy. So what, what's, what's coming out of the temple is, is coming from the presence of God and it's infused with holiness and it touches things and instead of killing them, it actually makes them grow and makes them thrive. So we get this kind of reversal. So in the, under the Old Testament law, you, you, something had to die. You had to have this blood sprinkled on you in order to, to be in the presence of holiness. And now th- there's, this, there's this idea that someday holiness is gonna flow out from the presence of God and transform people and change their nature. Then Jesus comes along. And when Jesus encounters ordinary people who are dealing with sin and death, sin and let's say sickness, sin and leprosy, leprosy leads to death, right? What, what does Jesus do? Does he, does he require people to become consecrated in order to be in his presence? No, what does he do? He touches lepers. What is supposed to happen when an ordinary person touches a leper? They're supposed to get leprosy. What, is ha- what happens when Jesus touches a leper? They get well. So there is this transfer. Jesus, who is holy, he is the presence of God among people. When he touches people, they get well. When he touches people, he forgives their sins. Jesus can personally deal with sin and death through his presence, his touch. He is is infusing the people around him with holiness. It's a beautiful picture. And for the Jews who understood what holiness meant and understood that there had to be a cost paid, they, they know the other shoe has to drop eventually. This can't be free. We can't just, God, God's not just giving holiness out willy-nilly. Like there has to be a price to be paid. And we do know the price, right? Jesus himself, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so when we, as people who are hundreds of years later, come in contact with the blood of the lamb, we are then consecrated and you and I are made holy. So the question is not, how do you become holy? The question is, are you already holy? According to scripture, If you've been washed in the blood of the lamb, you are holy. Congratulations, you're holy. You didn't wake up this morning feeling holy, did you? Most of us were like, oh man, I'm gonna try to make it to church because it's the right thing to do, but I really would rather stay home. I don't feel super holy today. Guess what? You're holy, you're already holy. And so when we come to this uh, passage in Peter, so when 
Peter, Peter got to see all this happen in person. He, he watched Jesus infuse people with holiness by touching them. He watched Jesus forgive sins and make people holy with his words. And this is what Peter writes to the Christians who are living after the ascension of Jesus. 1 Peter 2.9, you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Peter is looking at all of these believers and don't don't think for a minute that they're any different from us. Don't think for a minute that these people are all morally perfect. They're just like us. They struggle. And Peter looks at him and says, you are a holy nation. Why? There is a purpose to their holiness. What is the purpose? So that we can declare the praises of him who called us out of darkness into light. We have been made holy, brought from darkness to light, brought from death to life by our contact with Jesus and his blood. We've been made holy. And so then Peter will go on and say, now live like it. (laughs) You're holy, now live like it. It's not a matter of whether you're holy or not. It's the choice of, are you going to live like it? We don't get to choose all of our roles and all of our identities. So uh, a couple weeks ago, our friends Justin and Katie had a baby. This is Lila Pollock, and she is precious and so tiny. Oh, my goodness. Her head just is like, fits right in there. (sighs) Okay, anyway. Um, So on January the 10th, Justin and Katie were, they're just people, right? They're, they're just Justin and Katie. They're, they're a husband and wife, you know? They're, they're sons and daughters. On January 11th, they became a mom and a dad. They had never been a mom and dad until this moment. They became a mom and dad. Now, every day when Justin and Katie wake up, do they think, do, do I wanna be a, a, a dad today? Is Justin thinking, do I wanna be a dad today? I have a deci- do I have a decision to make about whether I'm a dad today or not? No, he's already a dad because this child was born into their home. He is a father. It's not a choice whether he's going to be a father or not. The choice is what kind of father is he gonna be? Is he gonna step into the responsibilities of fatherhood or no? He does have that choice, but he doesn't have a choice about whether father is part of his identity or not, right? This is, this is holiness for us. If you're a follower of Jesus, if, if you've been... If you've been surrendered your life to Christ, baptized into his death, burial, and resurrection. You are holy. It's not a choice of whether you, you don't wake up and say, am I gonna be holy today? You, the question is, am I gonna live into the holiness that God has already called me into today? Am I gonna live into it? Well, how do we do that? How do we get to this place? Because here's, here's where we're going. Um, in, in Revelation 22, this is how the theme kind of spreads. Do you remember the, the vision Ezekiel had in Ezekiel 47, where he visualized the temple and there was a, a river flowing out of the temple and everything it touched just grew and flourished and thrived? In Revelation, John has the same vision. Revelation 22 starts like this. There's, there's a temple. Or, no, it's not, there's not a temple. There's not a temple in the new creation. There's the throne of God. And from the throne of God is flowing a river. And on both sides of the river are these trees that they were calling the tree of life. And what do we know about the tree of life? It gives life, right? It's a very cleverly named tree, right? It just gives life to everything. And and this is flowing from the throne of God. And so we're getting this same picture that Ezekiel prophesied and Ezekiel 47 is happening in Revelation 22. There's There's this sense that the presence of God is infusing everything nearby with holiness and life and flourishing and thriving. That's where we're going. How do we, how do we get there? So this is what we talked about uh, at communion time. We're looking back to what God has done. He's made us holy by the blood of Christ. And we're looking forward to what God is going to do. There's gonna be a day in the new creation when everything in all creation will be infused with holiness by the presence of God. So now we're in the middle and what do we do now? So here's, here's what I wanna suggest that we do. You've been made holy. Your choice is how do I live into that holiness we're gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna act as though we're holy. We're gonna practice some holy moves, okay? So if, if holiness is the opposite of ordinary, so holy people don't live like ordinary people, right? That's what it has to mean when Peter tells the readers of his letter, you're a holy nation. He's, he's saying, you're not like everybody else. You're not like the people that are far from God. You're not like the people that don't follow Jesus. 
So we're gonna be different. How are we gonna be different? I'm gonna talk about three specific ways. I'm gonna invite you to um, embrace one of these as your holy move for the week, okay? What do ordinary people do when someone hurts them? Hold a grudge or you, you try to get even, right? Hurt them back. Someone says harsh words to you. <clears throat> ordinary people say harsh words back or they just kind of let that simmer and they hold that grudge. It may, it may turn into something like the silent treatment. Well, I just won't, I just won't talk to this person. I'll just, stay, I'll just be mad at them. That's what ordinary people do. So what, what do holy people do? What's the holy move here? It's forgiveness, right? When someone hurts you, you forgive. That's not normal. That's not ordinary. That's holy. I, I sat in a courtroom. I saw um, just a reminder of the power of forgiveness. I sat in a courtroom a couple weeks ago um, as, as this family whose life has just been turned upside down by the loss of a husband and a father are, are looking at this guy who, through his recklessness, caused the death of Tom Warner. And part of what happened in, in that courtroom was this message of forgiveness from the family to the perpetrator was restated. And I look over at Wendy Warner and she's nodding along, affirming again a year later, yes, you are forgiven. And that is powerful and it is absolutely not ordinary, is it? Man, forgiveness is holy. It's a holy move. So here's, here's the question we'll circle back to. What, what do you do when people hurt you? Uh, next, what, what do you do with people who are different from you? There, there are people around you who are not like you. They don't think like you. They don't vote like you. Maybe they're different ethnicity. Maybe they speak a different language. Uh, maybe they're in a different socioeconomic category from you. What do people who are don't like you, what do ordinary people do with people who are different from them? They avoid Usually, they make some assumptions that lead to fear, that lead to avoidance. That's what ordinary people do. If you're different from me, I'm assuming some things about you. Those things I'm assuming make me afraid and make me want to avoid you. What's the holy move? We move toward people who are different. That's the holy move. That's the Jesus move, right? Jesus moved towards people who were sinful, towards people who had crazy political views. He went towards them, right? He had people on his team, his inner 12, who were far left and far right on his team. He moved toward them. He brought unity. This is what holy people do. This is the holy move. This is how we deal with people who are different from us. We move towards them. Finally, what do ordinary people do with their resources? How do ordinary people think about their resources? Our resources basically are our time, um, our, our, our finances and our, our gifts, our talents, the things that we're good at, right? What do ordinary people do with, with their resources? They leverage them to make their own lives better. I use my time, I use my money, I use, because this is, it's mine. I worked for it, I earned it, right? So I use it to make my life better, to build a better retirement, to build a better home, to build a better you know, a nicer family, a nicer house, nicer cars. Like I leverage that stuff to make my life better. That's ordinary. But we're not ordinary. We're holy, right? So what do holy people do? What's the holy move here? Holy people leverage their resources for others. For those who, who have less. If I have time, I'm gonna use mine for people who don't have as much time as I do. If I have money, I'm gonna leverage my money for those who don't have as much money as I do. If I have a talent, I'm gonna leverage my talent for those who don't have this particular talent. That's the holy move, right? So I just wanna invite you as we, we, we're gonna close here in a minute with a song. Uh, so the band will, will be coming up here in just a minute, but we're gonna take a minute and pray. And I wanna invite you to uh, ask God, ask the Holy Spirit, what's the holy move for you this week? First of all, we're gonna acknowledge that if you're in Christ, you're holy. Are, are you with me? Is, there, is everybody holy? You feeling it? I know we don't feel holy because we think holy means perfect and we look at it in the mirror and we go, I'm not perfect. But has Jesus made you holy? Yes, yes, he has. The, the question today is, are we gonna live into it? Which means we're not gonna live like ordinary people who are not in Christ. 
we're, we're going to live like people who have been set apart for worship to God, right? So here, here are the three the categories. Um, what do you do when people hurt you? What do you do with people who are different from you? What do you do with your resources? One of those probably resonates with you where you kind of go, I'm not sure that I'm making the holy moves when people hurt me. Or I'm not sure I'm making the holy move when uh, I, I encounter people who are different from me. Or I'm not sure I make the holy move with my resources. One of those is probably gonna resonate with you. We're gonna take some time and just pray that the Holy Spirit would reveal that to you and that you would make a commitment this morning to make the holy move in that area. I'm gonna forgive. I'm gonna move towards people who are different. I'm gonna leverage my resources for those who have less. Would you pray that with me? It's a scary prayer because God might actually answer it and then you're in trouble. Are you with me? Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for making us holy. We never could have done that. Thank you for what it means that you made us holy, that we get to be in your presence. We get to approach your throne of grace with confidence. We get to, we get to have your Holy Spirit inhabit our bodies. It's incredible. We're so grateful. But we're also a little stuck between, Father. We, we know what you've done. We know what you're gonna do. And, and right now in this moment, sometimes it's hard for us to wrap our minds around how we're supposed to act and behave and live as people who are holy when we know we're not perfect. So my prayer, Father, is that you would, you put it in our hearts, God. Is, is there a way that we've been acting like ordinary people when we should be acting like a holy nation? Would you impress that on our hearts this morning so that we as a church family would live into the holiness that you've called us to for your glory and for the benefit of those around us? We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.